Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Happy Sabbath. Truly, we hear the Lord's voice speaking to us, saying, Come unto me. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Happy Sabbath, everyone. We're going to have a wonderful uh, Sabbath school lesson, I believe, this uh, morning. Uh, for the last three weeks of our Sabbath school lessons, we have been focusing on the fifth and sixth angels movement or messages, whichever one you want to use. Uh, the fifth angel had a message, the sixth angel had a movement. We learned that these, just like the preceding four angels, are all describe the work of God's people during the time of the end. Um, and we know that right now we are living in a time when God's true remnant are sounding an alarm. The first three angels are flying in the midst of heaven, while the fourth has come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth is currently being lightened up with God's glory. Pretty soon we're going to enter into the time frame of the fifth, sixth, and seventh angels, and so that's why I think that God is leading us to this study so that we can learn what those things mean and how to be prepared to fill the positions that God has called every one of us to fill. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for your wonderful, wonderful love and we hear your voice calling us to come unto you. We thank you, dear God, for how you have blessed us thus far this morning and even throughout all our life to bring us to this place in earth's history which prophets and priests have longed to have been here. But Lord, you have seen fit to give us the opportunity to be here. And so dear Father, we pray that as we get into this final study of the angels of Revelation 14, that we would really understand the solemn times that we're living in, and the high calling that you have given to us. So dear Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us and be our teacher. That you empty me of self. Use me as your mouthpiece. And that you will tune our ears to heaven. As you speak to us during this Sabbath school session. We thank you dear God. Protect us from all distractions. And shield us from the enemy's temptations. To wander off into other thoughts. But help us Lord to really receive this message today and help us all to take heed to the preparation needful to fill the position of those that you have called to come into the last final hours of this earth's history. We thank you, dear God, and we praise you. For we ask this in Jesus' name, according to your will, with thanksgiving. Amen. We're going to start off our study uh, in regards to the seventh angel as it is written in Revelation 14 verse 18. I might move a little quickly because there's a lot of material here that needs to be shared. So if you want the transcript at the end, just request it and I'll give it to you. So if you miss anything, you can go back and read it again and study it. Uh, a lot of this is taken out of the seven angels by F.T. Wright. So you can go back and uh, look at the quotations. I didn't go through the whole thing. I just skipped and grabbed a few things. Uh, some of the important points that I think will uh, give us an understanding of the seventh angel of Revelation 14 and verse 18. The Bible says, And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. This is the description or a description of the special work of the seventh angel's movement. The last of the series. When his work shall have been completed along with that of the other six, the Lord will be able to return to this earth to gather the great harvest of the redeemed. So it is only when the seventh angel's work is finished. Will the Lord be able to come and gather the great harvest of the redeemed? So it is very important for us to understand 
what this message or this movement is all about. By the way, it's both a message, it is a message basically, but we're going to see what it's all about because we need to understand this and it's going to affect every one of those who are living just before the coming of Christ, the 144,000. This angel like the fifth and the sixth does not address himself to every nation, kindred and tongue and people as do the first four. He directs his instructions or plea to one of the two beings who each carry a sharp sickle in his hand. These two are the sixth angel and the son of man in his dual role as king of kings and the great harvester. It is a very simple matter to determine which of these two, Jesus Christ or the sixth angel, is the one spoken to by the seventh angel. One has only to know which of these two responds to the message of the seventh angel to find the answer to that question. It is not Christ, we're going to see, and we saw this already anyway last week, it is not Christ, but the sixth angel who acts when the seventh angel directs him to thrust in his sharp sickle and reap the harvest of the earth. Though it is not yet obvious at this stage in this particular study, this plea and the response to it are vitally significant and entirely necessary to the successful termination of the great controversy, brethren. This will become evident as, this, as the study of the seventh angel continues as we move forward. So it is very critical that we understand these things. It has already been shown in our previous three weeks of this series of studies that the fifth angel carries the work forward to the point where even the most wicked person will see the real nature of God's law and his personal rebellion against it and will prostrate himself at the saints' feet to acknowledge them as the true servants of the Most High. Thus, this requirement of the long-standing controversy will be satisfied. And, you know, F.T. Wright calls it a requirement, and, and I think it is. It is a requirement. In the sense that God requires that every individual, every individual, whether alive or dead, come to the understanding of God's love for them and His true character. It is an absolute requirement. Because if it wasn't, then God would not be just. God has to reveal Himself and, and unmask the true situation. Even to those who have been deceived, He has to take away the deception so that they can see the reality and every single tongue will confess just and true are your ways, dear God. So this is a requirement. Thus this requirement of the long-standing controversy will be satisfied. The mighty waters of the great river Euphrates will have been dried up and the way of the kings from the east will have been prepared. In addition to this, the sixth angel will have been the instrument whereby another vital requirement is satisfied. What is this other requirement? This requirement must be met before Christ can return. You see, at Calvary, sin demonstrated what it would do to the Creator, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But it did not show what it would do to those who revile and persecute the Savior. You see, that's another thing that needs to be revealed to all, both dead and alive. They have to understand that it has been sin. It is sin that has done the, the great evil in their lives. It is sin that brought death and destruction upon many, all of those who have died. So while Jesus was made to suffer terribly, lose his human life and be buried in the earth... His persecutors appeared to escape any immediate retribution, remained in positions of wealth and power, and continued to receive the veneration of most of the populace. It seemed that the sinner was the one to profit from evil, while the righteous appeared to be the losers, even though the opposite is really true. You see, this has to be revealed to all creation. All. All. For instance, what was not seen by those who knew the Jewish leaders who crucified the Savior was the unrelenting soul torture which those men endured for the rest of their lives. I'm going to read to you a quotation from The Desire of Ages, page 785, which describes the absolute uh, torment 
that these men went through for the rest of their lives, the priests and rulers who condemned Christ, who crucified Christ on the cross. And, you know, what needs to be seen is that this is the result of sin. This is what sin has done and will do to anybody who clings to it. Notice what it says here in the Desire of Ages, page 785. The priests and rulers were in continual dread, lest in walking the streets or within the privacy of their own homes, they should come face to face with Christ. Listen to this. They felt that there was no safety for them. Bolts and bars were but poor protection against the Son of God. By day and by night, that awful scene in the judgment hall, when they had cried, His blood be on us and on our children, was before them. Nevermore would the memory of that scene fade from their minds. Nevermore would peaceful sleep come to their pillows. Wow. Can you imagine living a life like that? Oh man, I, I praise God that we have the opportunity to be free from that type of life. Because many are stuck in that type of life. They dread the thought of coming face to face with Christ. It goes on to say in uh, The Seven Angels, page 308, paragraph 5, what a dreadful fate had overtaken those men. Never again was there a night for them when they did not wake in its darkest depths with their whole beings tortured by apprehension and dread. Try as they might, they could not induce their trembling bodies to relax into sleep again. Many were the hours they spent pacing the floor and longing for the dawn to break. This was an ongoing soul torture from which they never found relief till they died. Wow. That is sad, brethren. That is sad. But during the day, they maintained their dignified composure and thus hid from the people the agonizing suffering which was sapping away their physical and mental vitality. Thus they were able to give support to the lie that sin blesses while righteousness deprives. Let me tell you something, brethren. That is the opposite of what is truth. Sin never blesses. Sin condemns and tortures and finally executes its victim. Righteousness is what blesses. Righteousness never deprives its, uh, its adherence of the many stupendous blessings that God has for each and every one of us. It goes on. It says, Before the controversy can be resolved, every question of truth and error must be forever settled, and this one included, brethren. What sin will do to men and nature. You see that? That needs to be included. That needs to be revealed. It must be revealed in unmasked clarity so that all, both righteous and unrighteous, can see the actual outworking of evil. When in the closing hours of the great time of trouble, as a mad, fierce, unrestrained outbreaking of human passion and uncontrolled nature forces, uh, I'm sorry, uncontrolled natural forces bring unbelievable suffering and sorrow upon unrepented men, all will be given a convincing demonstration of this awful truth. None will fail to see what sin does to the unrepentant. What then is left for the seventh angel to accomplish, brethren? You see, if this is so, and we saw this in the uh, message of the fifth angel, and even going into the sixth angel's movement, we saw that all mankind that was living at that time during the final hours just before the coming of Christ, called the closing hours of the great time of trouble, we saw that that great convincing demonstration was given to them. So then the question has to be asked, what then is left for the seventh angel to accomplish? It would seem that the fifth and sixth angels will do all that remains to be done leaving the seventh with nothing further to accomplish. But the very fact that he is there, the seventh angel, Revelation 14, 
the very fact that he's there and is described by inspiration as filling a role is evidence enough that he does have an essential work to do. Otherwise, he would not be included for God does nothing that is unnecessary. In other words, God, there's nothing arbitrary with God. So that seventh angel is there for a reason. When this angel's work is carefully studied as, and, and truly understood, it will be seen that his participation is as essential to the ultimate success of the work as that of the previous six angels. Furthermore, it will bring to light a very beautiful, brethren, a, bit, a very beautiful aspect of God's wonderful character of love and mercy. To ascertain these truths, let the facts about this angel be determined as we go on. So we're going to get into this seventh angel. And it's beautiful, I tell you. It's very beautiful when you think about, when you, when you understand it. Okay, so firstly, this seventh angel, he is said to come from where? From the altar, which is a different location from where the fifth and the sixth angels angel came from. They came, or they come, from the temple of God in heaven. Therefore, they cannot be the same company of people. Think about this for a minute. The fifth and the sixth angel come from the temple. The seventh angel comes from a different location. He comes from the altar. So this, they cannot be the same. Because the 144,000 are the ones that make up the fifth and the sixth angels' movements. Yet at this time, the Lord has no other company of people on the earth apart from the 144,000. So who can they be who come forth from the altar? This may sound like an insoluble mystery, but the answer is quite easily found. We're going to find that as we move forward. The scriptures, being their own interpreter, provide the answer. It must be expected that somewhere in the sacred writings, other references to souls under the altar will be found. One such, in, one such informative reference is found in the text describing the fifth seal. So we're going to go right to our Bible, and we're going to go to Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. We're going to see if there's an angel that, or are there some people or that come from under the altar. Notice here, Revelation 6, verses 9 to 11. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw, now this is John again in, in vision. He's seeing uh, some prophetic vision that gives him insight. Notice what it says. And this is when the uh, fifth seal was opened. I, and when the fifth seal had opened, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they, had, they held. Wow. John is seeing some people under an altar. And these were those that were martyrs. They were slain for the word of God and for their testimony. And notice here in Revelation 6, 9 to 11 that they do something. Now how is it that they do something from under the altar when they've been slain? But notice... Notice here, it's very uh, interesting that they actually say something here. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? That's what they say. That's their message. That's what they cry out. And they're speaking to God, right? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. It's amazing. This is like a conversation between those who died and were martyred and God. And God tells them, relax, rest for a little while. And you know, you'll be coming forth soon. You will be coming forth out of the grave soon. Very, very interesting, brethren. And we're going to see how this all lines up with the, the, the seventh angel's message. But here, it now becomes evident that the altar 
is the altar of sacrifice under which are seen the hosts of those who have paid the su supreme sacrifice for God's cause. They are waiting for the centuries to pass until the time comes for their resurrection. The unfortunate extension of probationary time causes them to ask how much longer it will be before they are delivered from prison. Wow. Now, a little disclosure here, okay? For those of you who might not understand that dead people can't talk, okay? We understand, of course, that the dead are incapable of, me of measuring the passage of time, that's number one, of feeling distressed at its extension, number two, or of raising the yearning question of how much longer they will have to wait, number three. The scriptures are very clear on the truth that the dead are quite unconscious of what is transpiring, either on earth or in heaven. And where do we find that? We find that in the Bible, in Ecclesiastes chapter... Matter of fact, it's, it's in a, a massive amount of quotations, but I'm only going to quote one uh, here. Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 6. The Bible tells us that the living know, they have their conscience that they shall die. But the dead know not anything. They're unconscious. Neither have they any more a reward for them. The memory of them is forgotten. In other words, their memory is right now in a suspended... Uh, uh, animation, no, not animation, a suspended state of, of uh, unconsciousness. They, are, they're no, they can't think, they can't love, they can't hate, they can't worship. They are dead. Basically, when you're dead, you're dead. And that's why we're waiting for the coming of Christ so that He can resurrect the dead from the graves so that we can all go to heaven together. God wants us to go to heaven as a great big family. No one is going before us uh, into heaven watching us suffer here because heaven would be hell for them if they saw how much suffering we were going through here. So God is not doing that. God, There is some special groups of those that have had the privilege to go to heaven, like Moses, we know that he was resurrected. We know Elijah was translated, Enoch was translated, and we know that some came out of the grave at the resurrection of Christ after Calvary and went with him as first fruits. So we know there's some a limited amount, a small group of humans that are in heaven, but in general... Most people are not. The majority that die are still in the grave waiting. They're waiting for the coming of Christ. And this is what we saw here in the Bible. The, those, the souls that have been martyred, they're, they're waiting. They're, it's like they're, uh, they're, they have sacrificed themselves on the altar of sacrifice for God. And now they're crying out saying, how much longer do we have to wait? This is evidence that they're not in heaven. They're waiting for the resurrection. Ecclesiastes 9, Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 6, uh, verse 6. Also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. In other words, until Christ comes, there is nothing that the dead can do except wait in an unconscious state until Christ comes to resurrect His uh, dead saints. So the sense then in which the dead are represented as crying out from death's prison house when they cannot in actual fact physically do so is symbolic. It is what they would do if they were conscious of what had, was happening around them while they are bound and helpless in activity. Uh, F.T. Wright uses the term wasting time when they might be sharing in all the joys of life, learning the great truths as they are being unfolded and rejoicing in the onward triumphs of God's cause. So more important though is the message with which comes from the cold, silent graves to the living. Those who walk in close spiritual relationship with Christ and who understand the principle that, is, that it rests with the living saints to hasten the day of Christ's return and thus shorten the waiting time while feel a tremendous responsibility to loved ones and believers that are quote-unquote wasting time sleeping in their tomb, tomb, uh, tombs. We know that F.T. Wright doesn't mean that they're wasting time. They wouldn't be wasting time. If they were alive, they would not be wasting time. But it's a, it is kind of like a waste of time to be in that grave. Wouldn't you say so? I would say so. Think of the loss to Adam and Eve, who have lain for over 5,000 years in the earth, missing out on all the tremendous developments in the great controversy. How much longer must this go on? 
That's the question. And you know, that's a question that we should be asking ourselves. Because we have a lot to do with the hastening or the delaying of that time. How much longer must this go on? That is the question which must escape the lips of the living righteous as they view the souls under the altar. They want to come forth. Think about if they were conscious. They would want to come out already. They would want to be uh, already in, 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 with Jesus Christ, learning and learning and growing and growing. We must realize too that if the work is not done speedily and the dead raised from their tombs on the resurrection morning, then the living, instead of being given glorious translation, will sink down into death to join the souls under the altar. Think about that. If we fail, brethren, if we fail, we're going to join them. Helpless then to play any part in the hastening of Christ's return. We would be utterly dependent on the living above to achieve what they might have, what, what we might have done. God is calling us, brethren, to close this work. That's, you know, it, <laughs> this is a, a, a serious and solemn time that we're living in. In the Great Controversy, page 581, it tells us that Rome, she is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. You see, and why would she do that? Why would Rome do that? You know why? Because God's people will rise up in spiritual development, in character development, maturity, that it would cause Rome and Satan to tremble, where they will reignite former persecutions. Let's continue. So even though the only actual deaths that may take place among God's people must occur before probation is closed, these martyrdoms are not, the, are not the ones referred to when the souls under the altar are told that they must wait till their fellow servants shall be killed as they were. Interesting. What is, what is being said here? That when these souls from under the altar cry out, saying, talking to those who, who have to be slain as they were, not necessarily talking about martyrs that will be martyred unto the time of uh, during the fourth angel's movement or message because after the fourth angel's movement when you get into the fifth, sixth and seventh angels or the fifth and sixth angels there is no more martyrdom so how is it that they're speaking to martyrs and this applies to the 144,000 we're going to see that it refers to the 144,000 who even though they do not actually shed their blood because after the when the fifth angel's movement begins there's no more shedding of God's people's blood but they're classed as martyrs we're going to see that they're classed as martyrs by the supreme judge of the universe and why? why does God judge them as martyrs? God does this because they actually feel all that a martyr can feel. It will be as if they had in fact died for their faith. Wow. And think about it. They would have had to have died completely to self. So that's one context in which they have totally died and had martyred the flesh. But also in their, their agonizing uh, experience it will also be a type of death you see those souls waiting under the altar of sacrifice for their hour of release are a part of that mighty harvest which Christ will gather when he returns in power and great glory the 144,000 are the first fruits but those under the altar they are um, they're being advised that they, the harvest, 
cannot be gathered and taken to heaven until their fellow servants, the first fruits, are brought to the culmination of their witness. See, brethren, they're waiting for us. And you know, Hebrews chapter 11 also talks about this. Talks in, in the final couple verses of Hebrews 11, it also talks about those that have been martyred, that they're waiting. They cannot receive their reward until we are successful. So they're depending on us. God is depending on us. The whole universe, brethren, is depending on us surrendering to such a degree that God can finalize His work through us and bring this great controversy to its final close. Wow. So, as soon as this is accomplished, the lives of the martyrs will be, they will be delivered. It will be affected. They will come forth, but they will not come forth before the 144,000 are finally and completely successful. Let it never be forgotten that there can never be a harvest until the first fruits, the 144,000, have fulfilled their divinely appointed mission. So everything is determined and dependent upon that final work of the 144,000. Wow. You can see how solemn and serious our calling is. Inspiration tells each and every one of us to strive to be among the 144,000. We are adm admonished to bring the flesh into subjection to the will of God. You see, brethren, by the time the fifth and sixth angels are doing their work, a very different situation will prevail. The time will have come when God's work will be poised for final victory, provided God's people measure up to the full demand of the hour. For unless they unreservedly surrender themselves to the Lord's service, Satan, not the Almighty, will be the victor in the struggle. And we will have to wait, wait, and wait, and wait, and wait, and wait a long time. But you know what? We know this is not going to happen, brethren. We know that prophecy tells us that the 144,000 will be victorious. The question is, do we want to be among that number? Do we really want to surrender everything, every particle of our being, so that God can be vindicated? That is the question today. Because it will go through with us or without us? The question is, will it be with us or without us? To ensure that they will commit themselves without reserve in this final contest, God does something. This is amazing, brethren. This is amazing what we're going to see here in regard to the seventh angel. Because God does something to ensure that they will commit themselves without reserve in this final contest. And what is that that God does? He does something. The voices from the graves will provide a mighty incentive without which the righteous would fail. Wow! This seventh angel's message is vital for the success of the 144,000. If this seventh angel would not do its work, they would fail. We're told they would fail, which is kind of an oxy, it's almost a paradox, right? Because they're sealed. How can they fail, right? That's what you could be thinking in your mind. How can they fail? But this gives them the, the energy to finish just like Christ. We're going to look at that. We're going to see the parallels with Christ because remember Christ in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, what was He doing? He was praying for this cup to be what? Removed? Would it have been possible for Christ to fail even at that time, even though He was perfected? Think about this for a moment, brethren. We're going to see how this all comes into play. You know, at that time, no longer will those voices ask, How long? For that will no longer be the point. The critical climactic hour will have arrived. And the great question will then be, 
Will the living rise to the, to the, to the demands of the hour so as to ensure victory for God's cause? You know, it is safe to say that without this appeal from the graves, they would, they would not. Because think about, like I said before, Christ. Christ was also going through that grave uh, experience in Gethsemane. It was as if he was being martyred himself, even before he was actually martyred, wasn't it? He was, he was you know, uh, sweating blood. You know, he was, he was his, his, the agonizing uh, uh, torture, I would say, the agonizing torture of his soul was so intense that his capillaries were bursting and blood was coming out of his pores. Think about that. He was being martyred even before he was on the cross. The 144,000 will go through the same experience. And he was praying, let this cup pass from me, which was not answered, by the way. It wasn't answered in that way. It, something had to be done for him to succeed. Same thing will be with the 144,000. And we're going to see what that is as we go on. So it is safe to say that without this appeal from the graves, they would not be successful. But how can this be? Surely they will have sufficient motivation to spur them on to give an unstinted service, a total sacrifice, and an unlimited expenditure of all they have to ensure that the victory shall be won in the utter defeat of sin. Right? Don't we think so? One would expect that to be so until consideration is given to what they will have become by this time. You see, the image of Christ would have been fully developed in them. Right? They would have had the image of Christ fully developed in them, which means that they, like Christ, would be dispossessed of any disposition to fight uh, for their rights. We're going to see that. This is an important point, brethren. We're going to see that what the seventh angel does is going to motivate them to rest. To rest even further when they're tempted not to rest. Because during the sixth angel's movement, we're going to see that they're tempted to protect others and to do things. But... The image of Christ in them means that they would be like Him, dispossessed of any disposition to fight for their rights. This development of the divine likeness in them is the ultimate objective of Christ's heavenly ministry. And when it is achieved, brethren, He will come the second time as it is written. In Christ Object Lessons, page 69, it says, When the fruit is brought forth, Immediately he put it in the sickle because the harvest is come. Christ is waiting with longing and desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. And when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. You see, they're going to be tempted to fight for their rights in the sense that they would want to protect those that they see slaughtering each other. They will want to step in the fray and put themselves in the middle of these people that want to annihilate each other. But this, and because they're tempted to do this and they're, they're almost ready to give in, to go and step in, the seventh angel has to step in. The seventh angel's message has to be given for them to say, no, I can't. I'm not, I, I must rest. I must rest and let what happens is going to happen. They're going to have to put away their, their disposition to fight for what they think is their right. You see, brethren, this can only mean that the same responses to a given situation which appeared in Christ will likewise appear in them. And we're going to look at this parallel of Gethsemane. One thing that Jesus would never do, by the way, was to fight for His rights. What did He do? He didn't fight for His rights. He only fought for truth. Desire of Ages, I'm going to read another quotation from the Desire of Ages, page 89. It says, Jesus did not contend for his rights. Interesting. Remember, the 144,000 are going to be tempted to contend for their rights. 
the right to stand up and try to separate and try to protect and whatever they think they, 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 they're tempted to do at that time. But Jesus never contended for his right. Often his work was made unnecessarily severe because he was willing and uncomplaining. Matter of fact, they might even be tempted to say, to, 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 to reprove the, 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 the wicked at that time. You know, even though there's nothing that they really can say to them. But yet, Christ did not fail nor become discouraged. He lived above these difficulties. So, we're going to be tempted to become discouraged and fail. But He, Christ, lived above that, as if in the light of God's countenance. He did not retaliate when roughly used, but bore insult patiently. And you know, the temptation, think about this now, even though we might be sealed, temptations are still going to be there. Temptations will always, while we remain alive, temptations are always going to be there. We're going to have to be crucified completely during the time. Even now, we should be doing that. We should be now allowing God to truly fortify us so that we can be completely uh, um, uh, protected from our own self. Because self is going to want to tempt us to, to, to defend our right. You know, sometimes... Uh, Think about it at that time. They're going to be surrounded also. Remember this. The, the 144,000, we're going to be in secluded places, right? Many of us might be thrown into prisons, right? Many of us, if we are among them, if we're blessed to be among them, right? If we remain faithful, we, we would be where? Many of us would be probably in prison. Some of us would be in, in rural places. But eventually, those are just temporary reprieves. We're told that no matter where we're at, it, eventually we're going to be surrounded. Eventually, we're going to be surrounded by the wicked. And we might be tempted to stand up for our rights and say, no, you know, you're wrong and whatever. We might be tempted to, to do something, to do, you know, whatever. We have to remember that God is so awesome that He gives us everything that we need, all the tools necessary so that we don't give in to the flesh. And we're going to see that this is actually what the seventh angel's message does for the 144,000. It gives them the ammunition to be fortified against the temptation to stand up for their rights. Even if it was to, to say, resist the throng of individuals coming against them when they know they did nothing wrong. Let's continue. Um, so as surely as Christ never fought for His rights, neither will the 144,000. This will create a problem for in the time of the end, the kingdom will belong to them by right, but the wicked will be doing their utmost to resist their possession, their possessing that right. In order for the righteous to acquire that which is theirs, they would have to enter into contention over the matter, but the Christ-like attributes within them will not permit this. They will not fight for their rights. Thus the very righteousness without which they could never gain the victory seems certain to deny them that victory. It seems so. But we'll see what the case is. So it follows that if the victory is to be gained, the Lord must provide some other incentive for them to carry the battle through to its final conclusion. He can do this on the basis of another Christ-like attribute, the spirit of selfless service. While they will not fight for their own rights, they will do all that God directs to meet the needs of others. Buried in their graves is a vast movement of people in desperate need. Think about this now. The righteous dead in the graves... They're resting in the graves, but they're in, in a type of desperate need. A need which can be filled by Christ only if the first fruits fulfill their divinely appointed mission. Lying in their graves is the mighty harvest of the righteous dead, who imprisoned, unconscious, and immobile in their narrow beds, are powerless to lift themselves back into the arena of living activity. Others must do for them what they cannot do for themselves. In other words, they're counting on the 144,000 
to be victorious. Now, during the seventh angel's message, the 144,000 come to the point where they understand this perfectly. And how do they do this? The Holy Spirit directs their minds to the plight of those wonderful people. Adam, Eve, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Daniel, Paul, and millions of others, included, including their own loved ones, who have been snatched from them by death. From their graves, they hear them crying, in effect, thrust in your sharp sickle and reap. Now is the time. Do it so that we can be delivered from this terrible prison to again become living, active servants of the Most High. It is an appeal to which the Lord's final army will be unable to turn a deaf ear. We're going to see how God does this. Because, you know, they're dead. They can't really speak, right? The 144,000 will be thoroughly con conversant with the responsibilities that they bear as the first fruits toward Christ, the Lord of the harvest, and the righteous multitudes who cannot arise from death until the first fruits have fulfilled their mission. They will understand this far better than the dim consciousness of it that, we're pre 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 that, they, that we presently have today. In other words, right now we can hear this and we're, we're uh, studying this, but how, how much of an impact does it really have in the way we function? You know, we have become so desensitized, but God is going to make us so sensitized, I would say sensitized, right, that we will actually feel the conviction at that time that we must stand victorious even for, the, for those who have went before us. Those who have gone before us, who are waiting to come out of their dusty beds. The 144,000 will understand uh, that the, these voices from the grave have a high and mighty appeal. It's going to be more than what we have today. Because today we, we can't, you know, many of us don't really, we, we, it doesn't really affect us like it will at that time. But hopefully it, it will, and hopefully it does, and it starts to today. When we start, when we really understand this message, I pray that it will affect us today. That it will, we will begin to realize, wow, there's billions that are depending on us. Billions, not even just among the living, but among the dead. Any hesitancy on the part of the righteous will disappear as they become acu acutely aware of the plight encompassing their dead brethren. With this mighty motivation, they will plunge without reservation into the last great struggle, thinking and working only for others and giving no thought for themselves. They're going to realize that what they need to do, it needs to be done for all those that have gone before them. But how will the dead speak to the 144,000? That, that must be the question going on in every one of our minds by this time. How will the dead speak to the 144,000? Well, now we're going to get into how Christ was spoken to by the history of the human race in Gethsemane. Because just as Christ was spoken to by the history of the human race in Gethsemane, it's just exactly on how the dead will speak to the 144,000. So we're going to read a quotation from the Desire of Ages, page 690 and 693. Inspiration says this. This is Christ in Gethsemane. And we're going to see what gave him the, the strength, the impetus to go forward and to f complete the mission. Because he was praying, Lord, let this cup pass from me. And if God would have answered that prayer, we would have all been history. <laughs> None of us would have ever had any opportunity to be saved in the kingdom. But thank God, he, that's one prayer that God the Father didn't answer the way it was asked. Well, actually it was because he said, but nonetheless, the third time he prayed, he said, Thy will be done, not mine. So yeah, you can say he answered it in that context. He did his will, not that will of the flesh that was calling Christ to, to give up that cup. But notice here, three times he had uttered that prayer, which we were just talking about. Three times has humanity shrunk from the last crowning sacrifice. 
But now the history... Now notice what God does now. So God had to do something to give him that impetus. He had to send the voices of even the dead to come and give Christ encouragement. Same thing that he will do to the 144,000. So notice what God does now. But now the history of the human race comes up before the world's Redeemer. He sees that the transgressors of the law, if left to themselves, must perish. He sees the helplessness of man. He sees the power of sin. The woes and lamentations of the doomed would rise before him. He beholds its impending fate. And his decision is made. Praise the Lord. He will save man at any cost to himself. He accepts his baptism of blood. Remember the 144,000? They get a baptism of blood too. Why? They go through the sea of blood with those horses. He accepts this baptism of blood, which is like a, a martyr. He's being even martyred at that time. Just like the 144,000 are receive a type of martyrdom. He accepts his baptism of blood that through him, perishing millions may gain everlasting life. He has left the courts of heaven where all is purity, happiness, and glory to save that one lost sheep, the one world that has fallen by transgression. And he will not turn from his mission. He will become the propitiation of the race that has willed to sin. His prayer now breathes only submission. This is when he came to that point where he says, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, I drink it, thy will be done. That's exactly what happens to the 144,000. They get to the same place that Christ gets in Gethsemane. That is a horrifying uh, uh, situ uh, experience. But you know what? Blessed be those who can experience the experience of Christ as he went through Gethsemane. So it's a type of Gethsemane experience that the 144,000 will experience. And they need that extra boost to go forward. You see, brethren, Christ emerged the victor from his, this titanic battle. We can call it a titanic battle. To win. But to win, he had to have every favorable factor and faculty at his disposal. If any one of these had not been available and present, his failure would have been certain. If God would not have given him that vision, he would have failed. Thus, necessary as it was, it was not enough to be blessed with the infinite love of the Godhead. Nor was it sufficient to have made a previous commitment to His Father, the universe, and to mankind, that He would undertake the salvation of the lost, no matter what the cost might be to Himself. The terrible weakness and sinfulness of His humanity all but canceled out these mighty factors to the point where He was literally teetering on the brink of disaster. At this critical stage, there had to be called in one other factor, which was, as we have already seen, the appeal that came from the human family, even though they, in their spiritually dead condition, were unmindful of the fact that they were actually making the appeal. Think about it. Man, I tell you, just when it, at the point of failure, God throws, brings in a new artillery. Boom! a super weapon and says guess what my people are not going to fail my son is not going to fail this mission cannot fail because I'm going to bring in the big guns you see our God has the big guns not Satan Satan might surround us with his hosts of humans with guns but those are little guns our father in heaven has the big guns and he's going to bring in those big guns when we need to use them just like he brought the big guns in when Christ was teetering on the brink of disaster. So brethren, be encouraged. We have a mighty God. So the same way, likewise, the same way God spoke to Christ, at that very time when He needed it, He brought in the big guns. Likewise, the dead in their graves, even though they'll, they're unmindful of the appeal that they will be making to the living righteous, they will not know it any more than when 
in the Middle Ages, they were unaware of their making this plea. How long, O Lord God, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood of, of those who dwell on the earth. The same way, they're unconscious. The same way the history of the living uh, of, of those came to Christ were, were unconscious. Even though the impact and significance of their appeal is unknown to them, it will still be... I'm going to ask uh, you to please keep your mics on mute when you come in. Thank you. And God bless. So that there's no distractions. So even though the impact and significance of their appeal is unknown to them, it will still be the deciding factor in the whole issue. As the message sounding from the graves reaches the 144,000, they will rise to the highest levels of selfless, selflessness and total sacrifice to do the will of God, irrespective of the cost to themselves. Then the victory will be gained, as it was in Gethsemane. That consecrated place to which in solemn awe those who would be members of that last illustrious company must often trace their steps. There is given the clearest picture possible of the experience there, we're talking about Gethsemane, is given the clearest picture possible of the experience through which the final army of God's true children will pass. So it will not be an easy one, but it will be a victorious one. God brings in the big guns. And it will be the voice of the martyrs coming to our minds, coming to our conscience, coming to our conviction. The seven angels, page 321, paragraph 3 says, God's provision for the sleeping saints to share in the final work. This is the beautiful thing. Now we're going to see the, the beauty of God's character in this. Think about it. God doesn't let, leave anybody out in this final work. They wanted to be in the final work, you know. Those who died before us, all of those who died, all of the prophets, all of the saints, all of the apostles, all of them wish to be in this final work in the vindication of God's character. And guess what? The Lord gives them a final place in the final work. They're not conscious of it, but we're going to see. God doesn't leave them out of the final work. In other words, all the saints of the Most High on this planet, all, both dead and living, will have a place in the final closing work of the great controversy here on earth. So their wish would have been granted to them. And they will be made aware of that later on. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You see, God's provision for the sleeping saints to share in the final work provides us with a wonderful revelation of His character. He knows that when they were alive, they, there was nothing they desired more than to see sin defeated. In the end, the Lord will not only give them the joy of seeing evil forever terminated, but will actually appoint them a significant role in the final act of the, of the great drama. At the time of their participation, they will be totally unaware of its significance. The joy that, it rightfully, that is rightfully theirs will be known to them only after the resurrection. But praise God, they've been given a part in this final work. So brethren, it is now evident that the Seventh Angels Movement is composed not of living saints, but of those who are still resting in their graves. These are who the seventh angel represent. This must be so, for while there are living saints to fill the roles of the fifth and sixth angels' movements, there are at that time not, none alive who meet the specific, specifications laid down to fill the position of the seventh angel. Every one of God's people who will be on the earth then will have come from the temple of God in heaven, not from under the altar as the seventh angel's movement is said to do. Therefore, only the vast company of people sleeping in their graves can qualify. These are they who cry to the sixth angel to thrust in his sickle and gather the clusters of the earth's vine and trample them in the great winepress of God's wrath. The sixth angel does as he is bidden. His commission is fulfilled when the living righteous, motivated by the need to remove the obstructions to the resurrection of the just, fulfill their appointed role. Then, brethren, the end will come. Once the work of this seventh angel is completed, and the sixth and fifth angels, th those who represent the fi fifth and sixth angels, are victorious and hold their peace, and do not stand up for what is called their rights to this earth and to whatever else may be, that's when Christ will then come. 
You see, the waters of the mighty and seemingly unquenchable Euphrates will dry up forever. The way of the kings from the east will be prepared and Christ the King of kings and Lord of lords will appear as the great harvester to resurrect his sleeping saints. You see, brethren, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18 tell us, for the, Lord, for the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, brethren, comfort one another with these words. So, the Lord's glorious work in the battle with sin will come to its appointed end. Except for the final showdown to take place at the close of the millennium. That's what's going to happen after the thousand years. It will require the coordinated services of the seven angels movements. Not just three as so many have supposed for so long. You see, many of us only focus on the three and don't realize that there's seven and we are part of the six. Each of these movements has a special role to fill, a particular work to accomplish, without which the work cannot be finished and the end come. Believers living in the earth today are to realize that they are candidates for membership in these movements. In the current one, which is the fourth, is combined the first three, for it is the loud cry of the third angel. Those who remain alive till the loud cry is finished, when the fourth angel will have ended his work of proclaiming the gospel to every nation on the earth, will then become members of the fifth and sixth angels' movements. None of these will have membership with the seventh angel, because they will not meet the qualification of dying and resting in the grave during the period of the fifth and sixth angel's ministries. Obviously, there is a great work of preparation which must be entered into before anyone will qualify for membership in those final movements. Those who do not see beyond the third angel's ministry will not correctly understand what that work is, for they will see nothing more than the need to become proficient in arguing the truths of the third angel in a court in order to convert as many as possible. But this is not the final work. The great controversy can be brought to a climax only when the characters of God and Satan are contrastingly demonstrated in all their fullness through their respective human representatives. The wicked do not have to make any conscious preparation for their role. They don't. To them it comes without effort. It is the natural outgrowth of what they are. Of what they are and of what they feel upon materially, morally, and spiritually, uh, and spiritually every day. It's, what they, it's, 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 it's just natural for them. It's who they are, right? We're, we're born in sin, shaped in iniquity. We don't have to prepare for that. <laughs> it's the default position, right? But this is not so for the righteous. They must specifically understand the target placed before them and know what is expected of them. They must resist evil with all the powers the Lord has made available to them, while cultivating every spiritual grace whereby the character of God will eventually reach full maturity in them. This is no easy task, but will occupy every moment of their time, will exercise every faculty of their being, and will require them to avail themselves of every facility provided by heaven for the purpose. At the present time, when there is still opportunity, the Lord is appealing to every one of us to reach the high standard set before us. And yes, Matthew 5.48 says, Be ye therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Yes, we know that in Christ we are made perfect. That's a context of perfection. Yes, in Christ we are perfect because His life is applied to our record. Righteousness by faith 
That's justification, right? But what, how, how much deeper does it get? It gets deeper than that, brethren. God is calling on the 144,000 or those who plan to be among or desire, let's say, desire to be among the 144,000 to take it even further, which means to fight the good fight of faith, to run the good race and to use the, the, the resources that God has given to us to bring this flesh into subjection to the will of God. And to have God's perfection be spiritually manifested through us in our characters. So that we can now be sanctified. So that His righteousness can be imparted into us. That is the ideal. That is the goal. That is the... That should be the, 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 the standard that we are running towards. That, that is the finish line so to speak. None need fall short of this. Why? Because every provision has been made that we may become like God. He will certainly finish the work which, has, which He has begun in us and we will rejoice as we see how effectively He will do it. Remember, He brings the big guns. He's got the big guns. Nobody has the big guns. Only God has the big guns. Soon now the loud cry will begin as the fourth angel enters upon its final stages of its ministry. Then will come the close of probation when the fifth and, and the sixth angels will perform their allotted task. At the same time, the seventh angel will make his vital contribution and thus see the work finished. None of us can know at the present time just where we will be or precisely what services we shall perform when these momentous events take place. But we can be a part of them and will be if we are faithful to all that the Lord has called us to. So brethren, may everyone who professes to be a believer in Jesus understand the implications of the seven angels' movements, seven angels' movements, all seven, and rest not until he is fulfilling his divinely appointed place and enabling the Lord to thrust in his sharp sickle and gather the harvest of the ages. Oh, what unspeakable joy it will be to stand on the right side then. Brethren, I pray that this study would have been a blessing to each and every... I know it's been to me. I just pray that it has been a blessing to you um, and that it has given you the understanding as it has given to me of what the final work will be and what the final work, work, need, what final work needs to be accomplished in order for Christ to actually come and to resurrect the dead and translate the living. It's not just the work of the three angels of Revelation 14, uh, 6 to 12, but it goes on further. And so, let us really surrender our hearts today, brethren. Let us, let us vindicate God's name. You know, He's calling for us to to finish this work so that the dead can get up out of their graves, you know, and, and, and enjoy eternity. You know, aren't we sick of this life? We're sick of sin, sick of the pain and suffering we see all around us. This is what we need to, to do, you know. It's going to be a Gethsemane type of experience, you know, uh, during that time of the fifth and sixth angels movement and even in the, till we get to the seventh. But the seventh gives, God brings in those big guns so that we can remain and that we can hold our peace and we can, we can not give in to any temptation to stand up for our rights. Praise the Lord. Just like Jesus Christ was given that extra boost to go forward, God is not going to leave us there stranded. He will always be with us and give us the strength that we need to, to finish this work. So brethren, let us commit ourselves to that. Let us commit everything to the Lord today. You know, and, and if we haven't committed ourselves to God before, let us give our hearts to Him today completely. Let us give Him uh, what He deserves to have. 
he deserves to have that nice pearl. He describes this as his pearl, as his riches, as his great reward, as his prize. Let us give him that prize. Let us give him ourselves. Let him give him our hearts. Let's, let's give him our hearts today and, 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 and make him you know, happy because he's a good God. He's a loving God. He never fought for his rights. And so all he did was fight for our rights. Think about that. He didn't fight for his own rights. He fought for our rights. Let us not think about fighting for our own rights, but let us fight for his right. Let's fight for his right, brethren. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for this wonderful study, this series that you have given to us. Truly, dear Lord, you are an awesome God. You are truly awesome. You bring in the big guns right on time so that your people do not fail. We see that, you know, even when we're sealed, you know, there's still a possibility of us failing. But you do not let that happen. You give us exactly what we need at the right time, just like you did with Christ when he was going through Gethsemane. And so, dear Father, we just, we're so grateful. And we're even grateful that you even give those who wanted a part in the last work, you gave them their part. That is so awesome. Shows us how loving you are, how beautiful you are. Man, Lord, make us like you. Make us like you, dear Lord. Give us your mind. Give us your character. Give us your righteousness, dear God. Help us to be like you. Help us, Lord. Give us that victory that we need. Lord, help us to see how serious these things are. Help us not take these things lightly anymore. Dear Lord, help us to really make a a decision in our hearts to go forward and fight that good fight and run that race so that we can honor you and glorify you for you are worthy to have that great pearl of great price. Dear Father, we thank you so much for sacrificing all to deliver this one lost sheep, this one lost world. And Lord, help us to give all to also vindicate your, your character and your name. So dear Father, continue to bless us as we go forward. Continue to Bind our hearts together to Christ and to each other. Lord, help us, Lord, to, to be your 144,000. We don't know where we're going to be. We don't know. Some of, some of us might need to be martyred because that's, that's, that's going to be the best uh, in, in the ministry that we have. But Lord, help us to just be faithful regardless. It doesn't matter. At the same time, Lord, help us to strive to be among the 144,000. Lord, we know we're in the final days. We know that this is truly an, a, a, a serious time that we're living in. A, a time of sorrow the beginning of sorrows and so dear father just give us discernment give us your direction and, and bless us according to your will may we use everything you've given to us in your service and lord we thank you so much we praise you we thank you for your angels we thank you for christ we thank you for your holy spirit we thank you thank you and thank you again lord again like i said be with us as we continue and bless every person within the hearing of my voice that they would have been touched by your hand today and that they would have been placed in your hand again afresh and if they weren't before that they would have been placed in your hand today for, for you are our great protector you are our great shield and buckler and only in you is there success and is there uh, victory in the end so dear father we thank you and we praise you we ask these things according to your will in the name of Christ our Lord and Savior with thanksgiving Amen and amen. Praise the Lord.